Grace and peace to you in our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this time of worship. We are grateful today to have Jesse Dickin preaching a message. Jesse is the Simpson Seminarian here at the Chatham United Methodist Church, studying at Drew University Theological School, and he is giving direction and leadership to our youth ministry here as well. Let us listen for a word from God as Matthew reads the scriptures to us. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzlingly white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. I'm happy to be with you today. I'm happy to show you my beautiful paintings that just so happen to be in the best lit part of my house. And I'm happy that Jeff can take a day off from all of his hard work. Now, I realize that I have to preach on one of the most robust and richest texts in all of the New Testament. And it's on the last Sunday of Black History Month, and it's on the last Sunday of Epiphany, so let's see how this goes. Now, in this text, we have Peter, a very confused disciple, and guest appearances from Moses, Elijah, God, and Jesus, all within a few verses apart from each other. Now, I'm not sure where there have been this many famous biblical characters before in the same place. Well, maybe in heaven. So this would be like if Beethoven, Bob Marley, and Elvis came together to record a song. I'm sure that would be playing on repeat on the radio, and it would be part of my morning commute. Other than the deep metaphors and miracles in this text, I am reminded that Jesus was a hiker, a walker, and a climber. Any walkers or morning climbers watching today? I recently learned that High Point is the highest point in New Jersey, ironically, and it's only an hour drive away from church. I wonder if any of you have had the chance to, to get up there. And if hiking is not your thing, I believe you can also drive to the top. The reason I talk about High Point is that it's almost the exact same height as the Mount of Transfiguration. High Point is just 80 feet shorter at 1,800 feet. So maybe in 10 years, High Point can pass up the Mount of Transfiguration. We'll see. Miracles can happen. Now, coming to this text when I read it a few times after reading it several years ago, I believe the Lord put a question in my mind. And that question is, why does Jesus have to go all the way up this mountain with his friends just to pray? Couldn't he do that in a house or walk to a quiet location? There was no busy highway, so there would have been plenty of quiet places to pray. There must have been a reason that Jesus was going above and beyond to pray on top of the tallest mountain in Israel. Then I remember that Jesus told his disciples eight days earlier that he was going to be rejected and undergo great suffering. 
If I was a disciple, I would have been stressed, worried, and trying to figure out how to not make this happen. You know, how to not, how to prevent Jesus from this great suffering. But the disciples were told not to say anything. So they couldn't process what they were feeling and couldn't really ask questions. Jesus said, do not speak about this to anyone. Those eight days leading to the transfiguration likely gave the disciples sleepless nights, just wanting to tell one person. And being a disciple was very difficult. There was much persecution and their leader would say many things that didn't make any sense. But then Jesus would heal people. So if you were a disciple, you kind of had to follow Jesus. You didn't really have a choice because of the power and the miracles he was doing. In a separate story, Jesus tells a parable. And after he tells it, people leave and Peter, his disciple, stays. He looks to Peter and asks him, do you wish to go away? Peter responds, where will I go? I have nowhere else to go. Have any of us been in this place before? Not able to leave our job or our situation because we had nowhere else to go. Unable to drop out of school or move apartments. When Peter is going up this mountain, I imagine he lets out a sigh under his breath. <sighs> Here we go again. He just wants to know what the future holds and I'll have to wonder what Jesus means all the time. As a college student, I remember there was a mountain my friends and I would climb, and there would be a cross planted at the top. On one occasion, making it to the top, my friends and I noticed that the cross was broken. It somehow snapped in half, and being the innovator that I am, I decided I was going to make a cross and plant it where the old one stood. However, I was immediately defeated when I found out it was going to be about $100 just for the wood alone. Now, as I was complaining about this, my boss overheard me and said, I'll pay for the wood if you make it. The next day we bought the wood. And in those next few weeks, I got a little behind on school because making the cross became the most important thing to me. And once it was assembled, I gathered a group of determined people to bring this cross on a two mile, 1000 foot incline journey. The hike was so strenuous that when we brought the cross, we had to bring it up in pieces. I remember telling myself, I don't think we're gonna make it up to the top. We could barely take a few steps before we had to take a break. I remember holding the cross over my shoulders and having, and after a few hours of plenty of sweat, we made it to the top and planted the cross into the ground. The reason I tell this story is that once I was on top of that mountain, I could see my house and pretty much all of my friends' houses. My problems and my worries suddenly felt not as big anymore. Not because I was looking down on everyone, but because we live in a very big world and sometimes our problems can feel as big as the world. But then I remember that I am just a tiny dot in one of those thousands of houses. And suddenly I felt like I was not alone and my worry didn't feel as big as it was before. That is not to say I still don't worry, but the fact that I had tests coming up and my car's check engine light was on didn't seem like it was the worst thing in the world anymore. My worries, although valid, didn't seem as big as I made them out to be. I can only hope that Peter had a similar experience, a similar perspective change or transformation as I did. Peter was smart. He knew that mountains signified where God's presence would reside. On Mount Sinai, Moses encountered God, and his face would shine just as Jesus did in this story. This is also the mountain where Deborah, the most successful judge in early Israel, sang her song after a successful battle. Mountains were where God would dwell. Maybe the purpose of going up this mountain was to bring about the power of God and to be in God's presence. Once Jesus and the disciples reach the top of this mountain, Jesus starts praying and he is transformed into Elijah and Moses. And God comes and he parts the clouds. Peter was so confused, he tried to make tents for them, but he didn't know what he was saying. God tells the disciples, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. 
the disciples are again reminded that Jesus is who he says he is. And even though he can be confusing at times, he comes with the power and authority in his ministry. This may be a reminder for those of you that are hikers to go on that hike you've been waiting for and see if you can experience God on top of that mountain. And for those of us where hiking doesn't come very easy, we can find our mountaintop moments in our day-to-day -day life. And sometimes when I feel I'm going through the motions in my week and I'm unable to spend time with God or find peace, I ask myself, what does my soul need? What does your soul need today? Do you need to find God on your figurative mountain? As I close, I want to honor what mountains have meant for the black community. I can mention Harriet Tubman, Fannie Lou Hamer, and many other activists, but I want to focus on Martin Luther King because in his last speech, he talks about seeing the promised land on the mountaintop. I'm going to read a quote that's directly from his speech. MLK states, Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficulties ahead, but it doesn't matter because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longe longevity has had its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to that mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory and the coming of the Lord. Thank you, Dr. Martin Luther King. Maybe so. And may we be eager to reach the mountaintop and to seek the mountain in our ordinary weeks and know that God dwells with us every day on the ground and on the mountaintop. Amen. Thank you, Jesse, for your reflections on the mountaintop experiences that you have had, that Jesus had, that Dr. King had, and that we each have uh, in, a, in the common place and in those special spiritual experiences. This coming Tuesday, Shrove Tuesday, is March 1st when we begin the season of Lent. We'll begin with our ritual of burning last year's palms, which will become Ash Wednesday's ashes. We invite you to come to the back parking lot of our church where we will gather around a fire pit at six o'clock in the evening and put our regrets on those palms. We'll write them down. We'll write down the things we want to let go of and leave behind. We'll put them in the fire pit and lift them up to God in prayer. We'll receive a shrove, which I'll explain on Shrove Tuesday. And then the uh, youth and the RISE team who are going to a mission project in northern Appalachia this coming summer will be making pancakes for takeout. So if you'd like to order takeout pancakes, please contact Jesse Dickin with the email that I'll drop in here. Or you can contact our church office to order pancakes, a slice of ham, and some syrup for takeout, which will be um, available at 6.30 on Shrove Tuesday, March 1st. You're also invited, if you are in the Chatham area, to our Ash Wednesday service here in the sanctuary at 7.30, Wednesday, March 2nd. Friends, let us go from our screens and go from this place. On the pilgrimage of trust, trusting that the God of love and the love of God is with us on the mountaintops, in the valleys, in the plains, and everywhere we go. Amen. <laughs>